It is real pleasure to be here and to be able to deliver this lecture. Uh, fracture mechanics is relatively new, but maybe not anymore engineering this, this discipline and uh, it applies to all kinds of materials. So we will also have to deal with advanced or additive manufactured materials, uh, taking into account the fact that we should never eliminate the possibility of uh, having cracks. Uh, this is also true for metallic materials. And uh, I will today present also some examples with uh, classical engineering materials like steel and focused on weldments because welding is, uh, unfortunately, from that point of view, one of the best ways to introduce a crack into a structure. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, it is probably also uh, correct to say that uh, additive manufactured materials also should not ever be considered to be crack free because in most or maybe all, all of these techniques, there is process of melting, uh, which is actually to be blamed for these cracks in the case of welding. So even when I present, even if I present uh, uh, examples with welded joints, you can keep in mind that it's not very much different in additive manufactured materials. Uh, for, for additive manufactured materials, uh, we still don't have enough experience in fracture and fatigue. And that was one of the uh, reasons that uh, and arguments that we actually were uh, endorsed with this project because this project is on fracture and fatigue of additive manufactured materials. So in my lecture I will present first some theory. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably many or most of you uh, know about it but for those who are new in this field, I think it will, it will be uh, very mm -hmm. useful and also for everybody just to go briefly through linear elastic fracture mechanics, stress intensity factor and fracture toughness. Then I will say a few words about plastic zones, which is a step forward to elastic plastic fracture mechanics, which we will not consider today, except some, some very limited up, uh, aspects. And then our uh, final aim is actually to assess or estimate structural integrity and for that we have to use fracture mechanics parameters. Then I will present the example which will involve weldments and then I will present an example which will involve additive manufacturing materials. Just briefly I will show uh, unsuccessful and successful uh, fracture toughness uh, measurement. Uh, more details about that will be presented in the uh, next lecture by Miloš Milošević and Alexa Milovanovic. Uh, then we focus our attention to fatigue, which is from the point of view of uh, failures, the most important uh, topic in this field because in between 80 and 90, fractures or failures are due to fatigue. So we will talk about Paris law, about life or remaining life, about crack growth rate and all that always in relation to crack length. Finally, there will be an example of uh, static and dynamic fatigue crack growth analysis. I will use hip implant as an example. Uh, I will analyze uh, metallic hip implant uh, 
produced in a classical way. I guess it was forging. But then again, hip implants are uh, excellent candidates in future to be produced by uh, 3D printing or any other additive manufacturing, manufacturing uh, techniques. So uh, what I will present equally applies to future implants to be produced in this new way. And some conclusions, of course, at the end. So let us concentrate on stress concentration to start with. This is very old. I'm oh, sorry, it doesn't work this way. So this is very old uh, scheme with uh, tensile stress uh, P. Actually, even that this P is, is uh, old, it should be sigma. And later on, we will use sigma for remote stress and for stress in general. And there is a circular opening here, hole, which causes, of course, stress concentration. Uh, I, I can say that, strangely enough, uh, uh, at least when this uh, circular hole is, uh, let's say, one order of magnitude smaller than the plate itself, Strangely enough, maximum stress is three times remote stress. Uh, and it does not, does not depend on the radius of this circular hole. So, uh, but as you can see, this stress concentration is not so small, it's three times. So we uh, have always had a in, in considering uh, engineering uh, structures, uh, we always have to take into account uh, stress concentration uh, in, in design and later on in, in uh, exploitation of a construction or structure, whatever we call it. Uh, so uh, that was a good start toward better design and uh, exploitation. And that this is about, I think, more than 100 years old. So these are very, very old analytical solutions, uh, which we will now uh, generalize a bit more. So please, uh, once again, sorry, please uh, have a look now at the elliptical hole. It is a large plate, so these limits are even not uh, presented. This whole elliptical hole is then one order of magnitude less than this width. It is under remote stress, now uh, marked by sigma. And uh, two important or three important parameters, but two independent, are uh, let's call this length and let's call this width. Length is 2a. This is the larger uh, X axis of uh, ellipse, and the smaller one is 2b. Also, radius of curvature in that case would be uh, square root of uh, a over b, well, b over a, sorry. So, uh, in that case, a uh, good old analytical solution would provide sigma max to be equal to remote sigma times 1 plus 2b over 2a over b. So 1 plus 2a over b is actually stress concentration factor. Uh, it can be written also as 1 plus 2 square root of a over rho, which is the radius. So once again, a stands for the ellipse major axis, b for minor axis, and sigma is normal stress. Uh, elliptic radius is defined here. What I want you to uh, focus your attention to is the fact that if uh, minor axis B, or at the same time, of course, this radius rho tends to zero. So if we shrink this uh, ellipse and uh, 
you can imagine that by doing so, we are actually uh, reducing this ellipse to a crack. And by putting some uh, limits on rho and b, uh, by looking at the limits, when they tend to zero, we are actually considering a crack. And now what problem do we face? One can see easily that in this case, stress concentration factor becomes infinite. It tends to the infinity. Sigma max is as much as you like. Thousand, million, whatever. It just depends on how small we choose B or rho to B. Uh, so, a very important conclusion here follows that actually we can't do much about cracks with this classical stress analysis. Simply this stress concentration does not work because if, if uh, stress concentration is 1000, for any sigma we will get the failure. But of course, in reality, it's not so. In reality, once sigma max overcomes yield strength, then linear elastic does not, uh, theory does not apply anymore. So that's the secret. But on the other hand side, knowing the secret, we didn't uh, solve the problem. So we need, we need something else. And that is how fraction mechanics was born. Uh, before I explain this simple uh, figure, uh, let me say a few words how it really happened historically speaking. So it was, well, exactly 100 years ago, in 1921, uh, Griffith uh, published his uh, uh, theory of uh, fracture based on energy principles. It was based on uh, conservation laws and it was uh, in accordance with some experiments with the glass. So it didn't attract attention of engineers who were dealing with metallic materials and who were dealing with fracture until George Irwin came back about 30 plus something years uh, and, and uh, found out that uh, this uh, Griffith's approach is actually a fundamental approach for fracture mechanics for all materials with uh, some modifications. And this is how fracture mechanics uh, was born, at least linear elastic fracture mechanics. At the same time, Orovan provided us with these nice uh, figures. Uh, explaining three basic modes of uh, fracture. Uh, opening mode, which is on the left, is uh, under simple tension. Uh, so crack is opening. And this is uh, far the most uh, important case because it is the most, let's say, dangerous. Uh, compression, of course, is... Uh, uh, in practically the, 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 the same mode, but it closes the crack, so we don't care about compression. Actually, we hope for some compression. Now, mode two, which is sliding mode, and mode three, which is stirring mode, they involve shear stress and strain. And knowing that shear strain is actually a mechanism of uh, plasticity, uh, it is uh, very logical to assume that these two modes are not as dangerous as the first one. So typically, if we say nothing, we are dealing with mode one. Now, let's see also some uh, heavy mathematics, which we are not going into details. Uh, so after failing to explain uh, stress concentration when uh, cracks are involved, uh, some mathematicians uh, came to idea to, to use uh, complex mathematics, complex stress functions. For example, Westergaard in 1938 
few years before him also Mushilishvili from Soviet Union. Uh, they they uh, considered uh, two dimensional problem. They involved concepts of plane stress and plane strain, which is very important. I will come back to that later. They used equilibrium equations, compatibility equations, area stress function, or B harmonic equations, and so on, to, to get stress distribution around the crack tip. And what they found is written here. Uh, it is uh, uh, correct. Uh, distribution uh, which was confirmed later on and uh, which is of course also quite logical because we here have r which is uh, distance from the crack tip and uh, it is uh, obvious that if r uh, tends to zero once again this sigma x uh, goes to infinity so from the linear elastic uh, Theory, this is okay. But then again, here we have a uh, very important quantity, which uh, is uh, characteristic for all stresses and which consists of uh, uh, remote stress times square root of PA. A is in this case a half of the crack length. And pi is there just because of mathematics, no, no physical meaning. And please remember this. It's very important combination of stress and crack length. And you can uh, see it once again here, but not written explicitly anymore. Uh, for this general case, for this 3D, no, sorry, it's still 2D. Uh, it, Case, but uh, written both in uh, Cartesian and uh, axial uh, symmetric uh, coordinates. Uh, now this uh, sigma times uh, square root pi a is here denoted by k1. And that k1 uh, actually plays even nowadays a fundamental role in fracture mechanics. Uh, for mode 2 and mode 3, there are also equivalent equations which introduce uh, K2 and K3, as you can see. I don't know why my cursor is from time to time visible and then not visible, but I think you uh, see what I mean. Uh, so we are actually in this way, we have actually in this way introduced stress intensity factors. Uh, K1 is far the most important because this is far, far the worst case from point of view of structural integrity. So let's focus on, on K1 and let's see once again how these characteristics of stress fields can be written in a simple tensor form. Uh, all components of sigma are simply k divided by square root of 2 pi r and multiplied by some function of angle. Uh, so for the infinite plate, uh, we can conclude that stress intensity factor, this is here in, in blue letters, is equal, as already uh, mentioned briefly, to remote stress, which is loading, and square root of pi times a in the case of uh, central crack, this is a crack half length, and this is the most important characteristic of a stress distribution. Uh, we will see soon how we can determine k. Uh, one of the principles is superposition. If we have more than one mode, uh, k's are additive, or there is a way to get k effective in any case. Uh, angular distribution of crack tip stresses you may see here for all three modes. And now let's uh, consider some other cases 
which are not just a uh, cracked central cracked infinite plate uh, of course in in uh, practical life with with real structures you will have all kind of different cracks here we mention semi infinite edge notched specimens finite with central crack specimens and finite with edge notched specimens but these are just specimens so uh, practical examples will include also so called uh, surface cracks which are probably the most important from practical point of view also loading can be different from uh, so far presented remote loading it could be concentrated force on, on a crack uh, edge and finally as I already mentioned elliptical and semi-elliptical cracks are of probably the most important uh, practical uh, meaning so in a general case k1 which is the stress intensity factor is some constant related to any geometry different uh, from the centrally cracked infinite plate and then this already well explained uh, sigma times square root pi a and then some geometry of uh, crack length of course uh, uh, dimensionless crack length so a divided by uh, w by the dimension in which a exists now, before going uh, further, let me just say that uh, a real breakthrough was not just to formulate this K, but also to correlate K with uh, energy release rate, or in other words, crack driving force. And that was thanks to Irwin's recognition of Griffith's work. So by, by this, uh, correlation, we actually got our uh, fundamental uh, support from uh, conservation laws. So K was a really a valid parameter to be used in fracture mechanics to analyze cracked bodies, cracked components. Uh, I already explained this. So now, first, we consider uh, our initial problem, which is uh, centrally cracked uh, specimen under remote stress. Uh, for the case when this crack uh, divided by W is not negligible, is uh, more than uh, uh, order of magnitude smaller. So let's say from 0 0.1, uh, we can notice that this uh, Geometric geometry parameter f actually starts to increase and starts to become not very big but still important. You can see for 0 0.2 it's approximately 108, maybe 11. For 0 0.3 it's 125 or so. For 0 0.4 it is then 1.6 and so on. It, 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 then for larger a over W, it will go really to very high values. But of course, uh, cracks which are half or more than half of the width are not really very likely. And of course, with such a crack, we will not consider what to do with the structure or component. We will just eliminate it and replace it. Now, to get this function F, uh, which is uh, depending on dimensionless ratio A over W, there are many different techniques. Some are based on analytical solutions, some are based on finite element solution later on, of course, and some are just mathematical terms for experimentally determined values. You can see the mostly used expressions which are really now good old solutions and they are very close to exact values uh, actually when later on they were checked uh, with uh, by by using finite element methods it turned out that differences are one two or maybe three percent so these solutions are 
useful even today because you can get value uh, very fast. Okay, this is now uh, exactly shown what uh, is this uh, uh, function in Irwin solution and all of them are quite close. You can see it also here, at least up to 0 0.3 or 0 0.4, they are close enough. Now let's, let's really uh, go to more practical uh, problems. Let's, let's uh, check and find out what are the solutions for uh, K in the case, well, probably the, the next simplest case is an edge crack in uh, the same plate. Uh, so the only difference is that crack is now here, not centrally positioned. And also pay attention that now crack length is A, it's not 2A. Now this 2A is actually historically uh, used for central crack plate because in that case, there are two crack tips. Uh, anyhow, uh, without this uh, small confusion about crack land, there is 12% increase in stress just because this is edge crack and not central crack. So that is C component of, of K that we saw in the last slide. And uh, we will get 12% increase in stress or in stress intensity factor, better to say. Uh, but also, uh, we will have square root of two as a magnification factor because in the case of a central crack, A is actually half of the length. So when you put these two in combination, actually it is uh, more than 50% increase just because crack is at the edge, not in the center. Uh, about the same analysis can be performed and concluded uh, for double edge notched. Well, these are actually specimens uh, which are used in, in fracture mechanics testing. And uh, here are the expressions for the F, for the geometry factors. Once again, this is kind of a Taylor series that uh, comes from some mathematical calculation. Some other practical aspects, if there is a concentrating force at the crack edges, then we have a bit different expressions and one a bit uh, strange conclusion that for centrally located uh, forces, K decrease when crack length increase because you can see how this expression, but uh, this is what mathematics uh, tells us. Now, uh, here are some other solutions for K. In the case of uh, internal pressure, pressure vessels and internal pressure, we can use K like this or like that. And also uh, for riveted or bolted plates, there are some expressions. So there, there are actually, uh, handbooks for stress intensity factors. Uh, before computer era, they were uh, very thick uh, books, literally, but now you can find it on the internet easily. Now we come to these probably the most important practical problems which are dealing with elliptical or semi-elliptical cracks. Once again, now you can see centrally positioned crack and uh, edge crack, but in this case, uh, cracks uh, have two dimensions because they are so-called surface cracks. So uh, length is typically denoted by 2C and depth is denoted by A. Uh, and such a crack can be fined typically as let's say corner crack in longitudinal section of pipe vessel inter, uh, interaction and also practically in, in any uh, engineering 
component. You can see here a detailed crack geometry. And now let's see what we can do about it. Uh, this is a general solution for the embedded, so internal elliptic crack under mode one loading. And we still have uh, analytical, nice analytical solutions. You can see it uh, here as given by Irwin with this elliptical integral. And you can then analyze uh, what uh, is the outcome, what this uh, phi, this elliptical integral is, what values it takes for different ratios of A over C. And for circular crack, then of course there is a simpler solution. Also, I can conclude that uh, typically maximum value for K will be at uh, this point where phi is 90 degrees and minimum will be at uh, this point where phi is uh, zero, where angle is uh, zero. Uh, and this, uh, follows the shape of the, the crack. I will explain it very soon. Uh, this is actually also on this slide, sorry. Uh, so uh, what uh, is conclusion here that uh, elliptical crack will tend to become circular because maximum is always on the uh, in the point uh, which is which belongs the maximum point to say which belongs to the shorter axis so shorter axis tends to become longer uh, and this is why in in both cases uh, if you have crack like this or inverse crack it will tend to become circular and that is very important not only in fatigue problems as written here but generally speaking and that is in a way well, good news, uh, in a way. Uh, for example, if we have a, a very short crack, opposite of what is shown here, and very deep crack, uh, that crack will tend to uh, grow in the shorter dimension direction, which is good news because uh, it will not go grow into depth. It will not break through the uh, thickness. Well, not always, it depends. But uh, generally speaking, uh, this is uh, something relatively good, this tendency for elliptic crack to become circular. Now, more concretely, for practical cases, you can see data about K which once again you can find in all kind of handbooks. Uh, of course, these are <clears throat> relatively simple cases. This is just a uh, tensile <coughs> sorry, plate. Uh, but uh, surprisingly, at least for components which are not too complex in geometry, uh, we can reduce uh, component geometry to uh, simple cases, which are shown here. Uh, you will see that uh, during uh, my lecturing uh, with the, the example that I chosen to present. You can see how we can reduce, reduce uh, a real crack or crack-like defect to some simple uh, scheme that is uh, defined in a handbook. Uh, of course, when you do that, we need to do it in conservative way so that what we use later on for uh, calculation uh, is uh, really worse than the real situation. Also, one should keep in mind for uh, more complicated problems which involve different uh, loadings, that uh, superposition uh, can apply can be applied this is due to a linear elastic uh, background of the problem 
and this is useful in some cases as shown here. So you can see it, we don't need to go into details here. And now uh, let us consider drug tip plasticity. That is a very important factor uh, because as you might recall about half an hour ago, I explained that linear elasticity, elasticity fails because stress will overcome yield stress as you can see here. So distribution at the crack tip is that sigma y, which is tensile uh, stress uh, perpendicular to the crack, tends to infinity, as we know, but there is some kind of cutoff here at the uh, yield strength. So once the stress, which is remote here and then increases, and then reaches yield strength, then linear elasticity cannot be used, but rather we can assume that there is a plastic zone at the crack tip, and it is very important to take it into account. And some initial estimations given by Irwin about the size of this uh, plastic zone are, are given here in relatively simple mathematical terms. Also later on, Dugdale had a significant contribution in, in this sense, but it is surprising that what Irwin did about 70 years ago, it is uh, still valid and this simple uh, expression is quite close to reality as uh, confirmed by finite element analysis later on. Anyhow, there are different approaches. You can see uh, at least two of them uh, sketched here, but uh, that's not uh, our focus. What we need to know at this point is that uh, all this story about K, about stress intensity factor, actually assumes that plastic zone is small. And by that we mean it's just a couple of percent of uh, total width. So if this is 5% of total width, we can apply uh, linear elasticity, uh, which is in that case also conservative because we still have this plastic zone, which would provide better material response and better material resistance to cracking than assumed just by linear elasticity. Anyhow, it is quite important to know a few facts about crack tip plasticity as shown here. Now, another very important aspect of this uh, story is uh, plastic zone shape, uh, which is uh, different from for plain strain, as you can see here, which is much smaller for plain strain than for plain stress. Now, plain strain means that uh, there is no strain in the third dimension and plane stress means there is no stress in third dimension. From point of view of fracture mechanics, plane strain is much more important because it's much more dangerous. Actually, plane strain can be considered as a constraint effect of the, generally speaking, stress strain state, which can lead to the fracture even though material itself, brittle fracture, sorry, even though material itself, is, it's not brittle. And that can happen if thickness is large. So by increasing the thickness, we are actually uh, confining, uh, limiting possibility of material to, to extend in the direction of thickness. And that is how we bring it to the plane strain condition. And this is of utmost importance for testing of materials. So uh, we will now turn our attention to fracture toughness. So K as explained so far, the stress intensity factor 
is actually a measure of remote loading and geometry, which includes a crack. But uh, K on its own means nothing. This is a situation similar to uh, classical stress analysis. If we know the stress and distribution of stress, we still don't know anything about behavior of this component unless we know what is uh, yield and tensile strength of material. <clears throat> Similarly to that, <clears throat> what we need to know in case of uh, K and in case of cracked component is, <clears throat> sorry, critical value of K, which is material property and which we call fracture toughness. And to measure critical uh, K, which as I said, we call fracture toughness, uh, we need, of course, some standard procedure how to do it. And most importantly, we need uh, specimens which are thick enough so that they are in a plain strain condition. This diagram presents very well what I'm talking about. So for small specimen thickness, uh, we can have something here which is probably plain stress, which might go this way or the other way, but it's irrelevant. Then we have transitional behavior when K, uh, K uh, reduces and asymptotically gets to the value which we then say it is plain strain K and that is fracture toughness. So we need thickness which is uh, enough to produce plain strain in the our testing. And of course, it's not always reachable that one should take into account. If material is very ductile, we can't reach this. Thickness would be so, so big that we don't, uh, that we can't produce the force which would be appropriate to break the specimen. Anyhow, fracture toughness is material property. It is uh, property that uh, can uh, provide an answer. Will material brittle uh, fail in a brittle manner once we also know what is uh, K, what is value of uh, stress intensity factor. So if the stress intensity factor is less than fracture toughness, there will be no brittle fracture. And if K is larger than fracture toughness, then a component may fail not necessarily that it will fail because both for K and for K1C, we use a conservative way of uh, estimating them. Now more concretely, uh, these uh, requests for uh, thickness and also for some other uh, geometry parameters of a specimen, can be summarized as, as uh, given here. Uh, thickness here is B uh, because uh, two conditions have to be met. One is plain strain as just explained and the other is small scale plasticity that I explained previously. Let's say that 5% is the limit. So if we uh, see that this is once again uh, correlated with the ratio of uh, fracture toughness and tensile strength, we can also correlate this uh, requirement with uh, plasticity zone size as, as given here. Now let us uh, see a few expressions and uh, part of a procedure how we really uh, measure K1. Uh, two most common, commonly used specimens are three-point bending, cracked three-point bending specimen as shown here, and so-called compact tension CT specimen as shown here. Now, in both cases, it is uh, not uh, uh, pure tension. In, in this case, it is bending, and here it is combination of tension and bending. And uh, since bending 
is is uh, even a worse case than a tension itself, then this is a conservative way of estimating or, or measuring K1C. But in any case, this is what is used as a formula to calculate uh, K1, which later on might be K1C, depending on uh, conditions that uh, might have been fulfilled or not. Unfortunately, from practical point of view, we cannot know in advance if uh, our thickness is uh, large enough. You will see, therefore, briefly later on, one unsuccessful and then successful measurement of K1C. Uh, some other details, how, how we really do it, are shown here. Uh, we need to measure so-called uh, crack mode opening crack mouth, sorry, opening displacement. For that, we need some special uh, devices. Uh, one of them is shown here. This is clip gauge. Uh, also, we need to measure displacement at the uh, force at the load point. So in, in, in either way, we can uh, get uh, load versus displacement or CMOD diagrams and uh, they can uh, have different appearance. Uh, you can see some of uh, those who are indicating brittle fracture. And then you can see uh, some uh, standard procedure, how we calculate, how we extract uh, force, which we use later on to calculate K1. It's not simple, but not too complicated either. But anyhow, to start with, we can always use uh, this Pmax if we just want to check uh, thickness requirement. And finally, for, from the point of view of uh, fracture toughness, and very important for additive manufactured materials is the problem of uh, anisotropy of uh, material toughness in general and fracture toughness in particular. So there are procedures how to measure fracture toughness in different directions for uh, anisotropic materials. Uh, you can see here some results uh, for aluminum alloys, for steel, and for titanium. All of them produced in a classical way, so they are not a big difference. This is not a big deal for, for in this case. These cases, well, in, in, in uh, aluminum alloys, there are some effects. But anyhow, for uh, additive manufactured materials, this is quite important and has to be taken into account. And so we come now to structural integrity. Once we learned about fracture mechanics, we should use it. So as already emphasized, practical application of fracture mechanics is its uh, uh, twofold interpretation, as I emphasized, on one hand side, uh, K represents loading and geometry, including crack, and the other hand side, K represents material property, or better to say, resistance to crack growth, if it reaches critical value. Now, a very important aspect of this story is so-called fracture mechanics triangle. In that triangle, three nodes are applied stress, fracture toughness, and crack dimensions. So once again, to compare with the classical stress analysis, uh, in that case, we have only two nodes. We don't have a triangle. In that case, we have applied stress, and we have, let's say, yield strength or tensile strength. We just compare these two. Now, in this case, it's very important to conclude that if we know applied stress and fracture toughness, then we may uh, calculate or uh, define crack dimension, which is critical. 
So in that case, we can say if we even uh, find a crack by non-destructive testing, we can say, is it uh, dangerous or not? Also, we can assume that crack is at least one millimeter because that is uh, usually used as a NDT limit because uh, we cannot uh, exclude cracks less than one millimeter even if our radiogram or ultrasonic findings show that there is no crack. So that could be uh, yet another analysis, even if we don't have a crack. If we say crack is would be one millimeter and we know applied stress, then we can say, okay, we need material with fracture toughness at least so high that applied stress for crack of one millimeter will not lead to a, a brittle fracture. And then finally, if we know crack or we assume crack dimension and we know fracture toughness, Hello. Discovered a huge amount of uh, non acceptable defects. Uh, they were in welded joints, of course. So uh, there was a difficult decision to be made. Uh, is it really needed do, 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 do we they really have to repair them because the cost of repair was well almost the cost of a new pipeline and then again also by their experience people who were in charge in charge really uh, concluded that the standard requirements were too conservative so they asked National Institute of Standards and Technology in, in Boulder, Colorado, to analyze a problem in more details from the point of view of fracture mechanics and to do so in a conservative way. Uh, this analysis showed that about more than 90% of, of uh, defects, crack-like defects, non-acceptable defects according to standard at that time, need not to be repaired that they cannot uh, fracture the, the, the pipeline, that there, there, be, there is no danger of more than 90% of these defects. And then the uh, Department of Energy, so I would say managers who were in charge, accepted this, and concluded that fracture mechanics is an acceptable base for admissible exception from the existing standards under these special circumstances. Uh, of course, under the condition that they uh, provide, that this analysis provides convincing and conservative assessment of structural integrity. And this is how structural integrity was born and uh, how fracture mechanics was first Applied, applied and recognized as a reliable technique to assess structural integrity. So therefore, uh, not only if uh, NDT reveals uh, cracks or crack-like defects, but also we can apply fracture mechanics for, and this is especially important for fatigue. In the case when we assume there is a crack as I told you, typically one millimeter long. Uh, so now we come to the example that uh, will uh, explain or illustrate how we can, in a really simple engineering way, assess structure integrity of a relatively simple uh, welded uh, component in this case it is uh, it is a uh, pressure vessel uh, what is written here actually already explained uh, 
So if K1 is less than K1C, structural integrity is not jeopardized. There is no danger, no threat of failure of brittle fracture. And even if it is more than K, if it, even if it uh, uh, K1 is uh, larger than KYC, uh, it's not uh, uh, for sure that uh, component will fail, but there is an indication for eventual brittle fracture. And as I told you, elastic plastic fracture mechanics is not our focus today, but just for a complete overview of application of its parameter. Here it is written a uh, few, few comments about J-integral and uh, CTOD as uh, most commonly used parameters of elastic fracture, plastic fracture mechanics. Uh, as I told you, we still will consider plasticity in a specific way. So not only brittle fracture, but there is a simple engineering way to introduce plastic collapse. So plastic uh, collapse is introduced in a so-called failure analysis diagram. And to, to get uh, to that point, we need uh, to know just two equations, expressions, which uh, are valid for yielding strip of uh, passing through crack in infinite plate as provided by Dugdale. Uh, these two expressions are very similar, actually, the, this uh, later one is just represented in a dimensionless form. And uh, here, we can see correlation between uh, stress intensity factor, effective value, and uh, acting stress, which are correlated by this expression. And uh, that actually uh, give us the limit curve. So this is the limit curve in failure analysis diagram which separates safe from fracture and unsafe from fracture uh, regions. So here at x-axis, there is a ratio between acting stress and uh, material property, which we can call critical stress. It's neither real strength or, nor uh, tensile strength, but something in between. Typically, we take half value. And then in y-axis, there is uh, another ratio, in this case, uh, k effective over k1c. So uh, these two points where you can see one here and there are actually uh, critical points, in this case, for uh, plastic collapse. So if uh, stress is uh, more than any measure of uh, for critical stress, then we might get collapse as, as shown here. And then on the other hand side, on the other extreme, uh, we can say there is a possible brittle fracture if uh, KR is more than one. So here it is a brittle fracture as a possibility. Here it is collapse. And in between a combination of these two, once again, not necessarily that component will fail, but we, on the other hand side, cannot guarantee that it will not fail. But if our point, which we get by calculating SR and KR, is somewhere here, then we can guarantee that component is safe from fracture. So this example will certainly clarify what I mean. Uh, this is situation uh, very similar to that in uh, case of Alaska pipeline. Uh, there uh, were eight uh, pressure vessels in uh, hydro power plant by Nabashta in Serbia, and uh, many unacceptable crack like defects were found, and three of them were uh, taken as most uh, 
dangerous to be analyzed by fracture mechanics parameters. So uh, one of them the, the, was uh, uh, a long uh, weldment. All of them were related to weldments, anyhow. One of them was uh, along the weldments in longitudinal direction, close to uh, this uh, transition from cylindrical shell to, to spherical dish cover. So in that case, local bending should have been uh, taken into account. We did so, but at the end, it turned out it's not important. Uh, the other was at the uh, circular uh, weldment, and the uh, last one was uh, also long, uh, uh, longitudinal weldment. In all three cases, they, they were not cracks. Uh, they were either incomplete penetration or uh, uh, lack of fusion, and uh, dimensions were uh, defined. Uh, so we could actually consider them uh, with a very strong conservative approach. First of all, we assume they are cracks, not just uh, defects, not just crack-like defects. We consider them as cracks. Then, uh, although all three of them uh, in a pressure vessel like this would present 3D problem, we reduced in all three cases problem to 2D by taking a cross-section. And by doing so, by taking cross-sections, we actually assume that one of dimension is all over the pressure vessel. So we consider just the other dimension to be relevant. And this is, of course, another uh, conservative assumption, because in reality, for example, crack does not go all over the circumference, but it's only 10 or so millimeters long. Also, by reducing 3D to 2D problems, we were able to significantly reduce uh, mathematical aspects of problem. We were able actually to use simple engineering tools and simple calculations to determine both SR and uh, KR and to define a point in failure analysis diagram in conservative way. Also, to be completely conservative, uh, for the loading, we have assumed that there uh, were also residual stresses. Of course, weldments are uh, known for, for that problem. And and we have assumed the worst case. We didn't have a data, but we have assu assumed the worst case, which could be for that type of element and that uh, geometry. And finally, for a fracture toughness, we didn't have material to test it. But fortunately, there was extensive, extensive study of that material welded practically in the same way. So we knew what would be the worst case. Uh, fracture toughness for the weldment and, of course, heat affected zone was uh, our candidate for that. So, once we applied all this, here you have some concrete data, which I will skip over. Here is a cross section for one of these defects. Here is the other one. And the final one, which was the most complex and most uh, dangerous, but in all these cases, we got the final result as shown here. So all three points, which were conservatively estimated, were in the safe region. Now, of course, once engineers do this, managers are in uh, charge of uh, uh, what to do. They have to decide, is this really uh, good enough for them so that they leave pressure vessel to, to continue working, or should they do something about it? Uh, 
These results are 22 years old. Management of uh, hydropower plant accepted them and uh, those pressure vessels uh, still works, wor work safely even after 40 years of construction and 22 years after these defects were uh, found. So uh, at this point, I will make a very short break, about five minutes, and then we'll continue. So see you in five minutes time, please. So uh, at this point, I will make a very short break, about five minutes, and then we'll continue. So see you in five minutes time, please. Uh, thank you, thank you, Alexander. We can we can have a we can have a break and then uh, a short break and then to continue after, in five minutes. Okay. Thank you, Livio. Because now we have uh, more participants that at the beginning, I would like to uh, tell you that uh, the courses up to yesterday uh, lunchtime are on Unicampus. All of you which were registered up to uh, weekend, so uh, Friday, Saturday last week, you should receive an email with your account uh, and uh, a, pa a temporary password. Please check if you didn't receive, please check on spam also. Uh, for the others, for those registered this week, so Sunday, Monday, I send an email to with, with the contact details that probably today you will receive the, the details to connect to Unicampus where we will put the deposit the, the lectures in PDF format. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 
You are ready. You can. You can. You can start. Yeah, just I just started. <laughs> okay. okay. Asking, asking if I may. Okay. So now I will <clears throat> present one example with K1C testing of uh, additive material. Uh, testing was done using this uh, nice new machine. Uh, material was produced by FDM printer with uh, dual extruder. You can see it here. Another 3D printer that we have was used for some other purposes, just to show you what our laboratory can do. And also we used frequently digital image correlation or in 3D scanner to capture the shape and to analyze uh, strains and stresses. Uh, concretely, uh, in, in uh, example that I will show at the end, actually we applied reverse engineering procedure for hip implants that will be uh, shown uh, later on by Alexa Milovanovic, and that was presented also in uh, Athens, where we actually uh, had a live conference that was February 2020, good old days without Corona. The last one, the last the one. Last, yes, actually the last one. I hope we will get soon back on track and see each other not only through this screen, so in any case, that was a conference with a very important uh, session on, or devoted, dedicated to, to our project, to CIRAM. So uh, just briefly here, because it will be shown in much more details in the next lecture, uh, diagram uh, which we record uh, typically in K1 C testing is shown here. So force versus displacement with maximum force. And uh, I hope my, my good old friend and co-worker Blagoj Petrovsky is not, not attending this lecture because I will show you now how you can briefly uh, def uh, find out if uh, your test is valid. And by briefly, I mean, mean this handwriting on the piece of paper which you might have at your hands. And that this is kind of improvisation, although using uh, equations, appropriate equations, but this PQ, the, actually we uh, used uh, this maximum force because PQ can be much different from maximum force. And if our specimen is 10 millimeters thick, you can see it here, B one centimeter, that's 10 millimeters, then uh, requirement for uh, minimum thickness, we get 18.9. We are sure that that was not a valid testing. So these uh, K values uh, written here for three different, four different specimens were not valid. And uh, by uh, looking at the fractured specimens, we found out uh, what was the reason. And that will be explained later on by Miloš and Alexa. Uh, once we found out that, we made a new set of specimens. You can see them here. <coughs> you, <coughs> sorry. After being tested, and you can see at once that they look good in, in the sense that uh, crack really propagated as it should. So even more enlarged here, you can see that crack goes more or less as it should be, certainly providing uh, uh, valid results, which are mentioned here. This is enlarged view of one of specimens, and these valued, valid results were in between two and 2.5 megapascal square root meters. So this is rather brittle material. <clears throat> 
and we need to know very precisely this uh, very small value of k so that we know how much this material is prone to cracking. Uh, of course, we need to compare this with uh, acting k, but experience tells us that uh, this is very low value. This is very brittle material. Uh, now I will focus attention to fatigue crack growth. Not going into much details because I guess uh, Grubovic, Alexander Grubovic, my colleague and professor from Faculty of Mechanical Engineering in Belgrade, presented uh, fatigue crack growth in, in, in more details yesterday. Of course, focused on XFEM application, but anyhow, I will uh, just briefly tell you a few words about uh, fatigue crack growth, starting with uh, some slides from the past, because they illustrate uh, typical fatigue problems. And those are uh, represented by cracks, which initiate at the stress concentration uh, points, regions. So before numerical methods, were uh, used, uh, there were some ways to take into account the fact that this is not just a crack, but there is some effect of uh, this uh, stress concentrator. And he here you can see how people managed to, to solve the problem. For example, this solution by Newman, this is already a numerical finite element method solution. And it, it uh, represents well these two extremes. Sorry. Uh, and then there are some empirical conclusions uh, how long crack should be to be considered as one crack, or how short it should be to be considered just as a single crack. Uh, similar uh, comments can be given here. Uh, this case here is typical for pressure vessels, uh, but this one is maybe the most important. This is a crack uh, starting from the stress concentration area <coughs> at the uh, window, airplane window. Actually, this was one of the problems, so-called uh, comet disasters. Comets were first commercial jet planes made in UK, but uh, a few of them failed because windows were squared without this radius and as uh, such they were unfortunately ideal for crack initiation and fatigue crack growth. So only later after these uh, incidents people recognize, recognize the importance of fatigue. Uh, for importance of fatigue crack growth, fatigue itself was already considered and uh, uh, very well studied uh, because of uh, this uh, axles uh, failure in, in trains and due to Veller and uh, other investigators, uh, design of uh, components prone to fatigue was much improved. But still, before this problem, there was no knowledge about fatigue crack growth and no, no, not, no quantification of fatigue crack growth, better to say. So, uh, it was uh, Paul Paris who first introduced, introduced the uh, equation which uh, follows this uh, linear correlation between crack fatigue crack uh, growth rate and uh, delta k this is uh, coordinates are in logarithm that's not important delta k which is the range of uh, stress intensity factor it will be defined in the next slide 
but it follows the range, the stress range. So the whole curve describes uh, three regions. First one is non-continuum behavior, and we usually think about it as crack initiation. Then once there is a crack, macro crack, let's say at least one millimeter, it might start to grow under fatigue loading, under cyclic loading as shown here. And then fortunately, it more or less exactly follows this simple rule, which uh, is Paris law, which states that crack growth rate is proportional to exponent of uh, delta k, exponent is m, and coefficient, coefficient of proportionality is c. These two quantities, c and m, are material properties, and we can uh, as we can measure them by using standard procedures. This region two is actually far the most important for us because region three is already leading to the final failure. We don't want to get into region three. And as I told you, region one is treated as a crack initiation phase. So what we focus on is Paris law and uh, this uh, region uh, two. And here we have th that statement also written. But then again, if we want to consider region three, if we want to consider the whole curve as shown before, we can use some modifications, which are always more or less following the basic idea of uh, Paul Paris. Now, I need to tell you a short story about uh, this uh, initial findings of Paul Paris, because this equation is purely empirical. Uh, we still cannot correlate this with any fundamental mechanical law, with any conservation law, but it works. Anyhow, when he tried to publish this result, all major journals uh, did, did not want to, to, to publish this because they didn't believe in the results. So they rejected his submission until he found some unknown small journal, so to say. And finally, they published this. And uh, except for Rice's J Integral and some Irwin's papers, this is the most cited paper in the history of fracture mechanics. In any case, just to go back on one step, uh, this uh, law or any other law allows us to calculate also crack size, crack length versus number of cycles. And uh, such a curve is very important. I will explain later on and, and show some of them. So we go now further and we uh, now uh, it will explain how we can use this uh, Paris law or any other equation which correlates fatigue crack growth with number with the crack length, or, or sorry, with the uh, stress intensity factor range. So let's assume that crack that the component contains a crack which is one millimeter long so that is practically and the, the limit and uh, let's assume that we know paris law that we know how crack will grow in time, that is actually a number of cycles. And uh, let's say after certain time interval, we are eventually 
here, crack which we don't know if it would exist, would be enlarged, would grow up to this point. So it is still far away from the critical failure uh, state, far away from its critical value. Now, if we once again test our component after this time interval, and once again we find nothing, then we can repeat this procedure as many times as we don't find a crack. If we find finally a crack at some, after some time, then we will replace our component because in this case, which is uh, shown uh, here, it was about uh, disks in uh, jet engines that were replaced before we knew about Fatikra growth, that were replaced according to their estimated life. So that was so-called fail-safe principle, uh, sorry, uh, safe life principle, which just that design would uh, recommend replacements of disk after, let's say, million of cycles, regardless of its state. Now, after knowing uh, about fatigue growth, after establishing Paris law, after testing material and finding those component coefficients C and M, and once again treating this problem in a conservative way, we can turn to fail-safe design or principle, which conservatively estimates or establish period of crack growth from initial to critical value. Once we know that, we can apply this reasoning as given here. So before we find any crack, we should not replace a component. And in this specific ca case, it was uh, uh, U USA, USA Army saved about a billion dollars per year by not replacing this as it was initially designed according to safe life principles. So, now let's see why is this not working. Very strange. Now it does. So once again, Paris model, Paris law, Paris expression, whatever, uh, is given here. Sorry that now A is used instead of C. That's the same coefficient anyhow. Delta K is now defined as K max minus K mean. That is the range, which is actually according to sigma max and sigma mean. So that is the meaning of delta. And also very important is the fact that we can integrate this. Uh, this is practically a differential equation of the first order. We can integrate it even in the closed form if coefficient y is not depending on a, which is not the case, it does depend on a, but anyhow, we can at least uh, divide uh, a, which we, a grows from initial to the final value. We can divide that interval into the small intervals in which y would be taken as constant as it is for the small difference in, in uh, initial and final values. And then we can calculate NF even in this simple analytical way. And we do so. We are not using only XFAM for this. We are also using good old analytical, or better to say in this case, empirical solutions. Uh, to uh, get C and M or A and M, whatever we uh, use for their denotation, uh, there is a procedure defined with, by ASTM standard E647 or any other standard procedure. And uh, we in, in Belgrade, in our laboratory, in uh, Military Institute, we use Cracktronic, a special device uh, by Rumul, and also they are 
uh, foils to follow crack growth. And this is a this simple device and uh, specimens are uh, practically the same as Sharpie specimens. So we use this not only to introduce fatigue crack, but also to measure C and them. And now uh, this uh, final example, which will uh, take into account both static and uh, fatigue loading. It is about uh, total hip implant. Uh, you can see here not only how it looks like, but you can see also why are we considering it because it well frequently often or sometimes fails whatever you want anyhow uh, there is still a problem with with this uh, component even i would say unexpected problems because according to loading these should not th th these failures should not occur anyhow in reality they do and this one is produced i think of uh, titanium alloy anyhow three major uh, materials, most frequently used materials for this purpose are so-called MP35 alloy. This is molybden chromium vanadium alloy. Uh, then uh, titanium with uh, uh, aluminum and uh, vanadium, uh, which was introduced for aeronautical purposes, but also used here. And then, uh, stainless steel as a classical solution in in all three cases the major requirement was not to interact with tissue with human tissue this is why we use special materials anyhow uh, neither of them is ductile enough neither of them is uh, resistant to fatigue crack growth in a way that we would like them to be so this is why we have to take into account all possibility of brittle fracture and also especially for the possibility of uh, fatigue uh, crack uh, growth and final fracture uh, when we analyze uh, hip uh, as a component uh, it was at least for me a bit of surprise that uh, loading is actually much more than just the weight of a patient of, of, of the body uh, in some extreme cases, it is uh, almost nine times uh, the body weight. For example, for, for uh, jumping or, or uh, stumbling over or some uh, impact loading, it is uh, as high as here uh, written. But for walking, which is much more important from fatigue point of view, uh, for walking, it is in between three and four. Uh, there are some data in literature uh, which are quite reliable to, to be used. And of course, this is conservative approach once again. Uh, failures are often caused by implant loosening, wear of material. Those are more or less in a, a brittle fracture manner. But fatigue is the most common case, and we will focus our attention especially to uh, fatigue. Uh, there are different reasons for initiation of crack. Of course, we should look for the uh, region of the stress concentration. And uh, it's obvious even if we look at this uh, component where it would be, but first we really proved uh, by static analysis and I will show you this just in a moment. Anyhow, let me emphasize that this problem is very important from point of view of uh, this, uh, all, all these different new techniques of product material productions because uh, in a close future probably these components, these uh, heat implants will be produced by additive manufacturing techniques so that it can be fast and it can be in uh, exact dimensions, custom-made implants. Now static modeling, which was done in Abacus, uh, was based on a CAD model and then 
uh, geometry modeling and then uh, data introduced, imported in Abacus and mesh was created as, as shown here. Mechanical properties, which were used is this analysis uh, for titanium, uh, produced already with some special technique and zirconia is used for, for this uh, part of a component. Uh, using all of them uh, was also uh, based on uh, loading and uh, boundary conditions. Now you can see force, the quantity and how it was applied. And you can also see that this part of implant is fixed as for the boundary conditions because it is implanted in the femur bone. So for the static loading, of course, so-called backside of implant neck is the most critical region because there is a bit of a bending there. The force is compressive, but unfortunately the stress state is not all around compressive. There is a tension here and the stresses are not very high, but still 175 megapascals. Yield strength of this material is approximately six or 700. So this is about uh, 20, percent of that loading but for uh, for static analysis for for brittle fracture that's not a problem uh, but for the fatigue if we take walking into account with large number of cycles if we take a, a person who is still relatively young and active then uh, we are talking about millions of cycles and so let us see uh, what will happen after millions of cycles. So fatigue crack growth simulation was also performed in ANSYS, uh, XFEM as a post-processing for, for ANSYS software. We assumed crack to be one millimeter. That is what I already mentioned a couple of times. We used uh, elements uh, for 3D analysis and uh, everything else was as for the static loading so crack was assumed of course here where the stresses were the highest and intention so you can see uh, force as applied here and fixed part of the component of the hip implant uh, now we can see this uh, model how it behaves it is already practically failed. You can see this large opening of a crack. You can see that uh, these displacements are as, as high as almost 26 millimeters. So this is already failed component. And the more important, we can see stress intensity factors. Uh, so for the initial crack, for the initial state, it is about 600 megapascal square root millimeter and distribution is as given here. So we can now have all data needed to construct this important curve, which is crack length versus number of cycles. Now this is only due to loading and material geometry. And we, let's say we don't know Let's say what is critical crack length. Let's say we don't know any material property, but still we can uh, use this curve to estimate uh, component life. Because as you can see here, as you can see here, let me remove this if I can. No, I can't. Ah, I have removed everything. So let's go back. Oh, it's even better this way. I will enlarge now diagram. Uh, so in this region, when crack starts to grow in obviously unstable manner, or we can say it 
crack growth rate is suddenly increased, this is obviously the critical region. We can say that this number of cycles shown here is certainly the uh, life of a component. Even if we don't know, in this case, we knew that 15 point something was critical crack length. But even without that, it's obvious that this is the critical number of cycles. So about five millions. Uh, that number of cycles is large at the first glance, but it is reachable by relatively young and active persons. Uh, so uh, there is still a problem. Actually, we need a material with, uh, at least for those type of persons, we need a better material in sense of uh, fatigue, crack sensitivity and, and resistance. So to, to finalize this, uh, this story, uh, let us say that uh, at least for this uh, example, that we got good results because this amount is uh, not only of the same order, it was uh, quite similar to other uh, models and experiments that we could uh, find in literature. So uh, even without our own experiment, which we couldn't uh, perform at the time, we were sure that this model provides good results. And also, uh, we, since uh, this was a part of this reverse engineering, let's say, small project, we concluded that uh, this 3D scanning, computer-aided design modeling and numerical simulation, also manufacturing itself uh, for newly developed additive technologies, uh, will present, will, will get, provides good results and will present a new trend in implant manufacture. So I think that's all from me. And now we have maybe 10 minutes for discussion or, or, uh, or chat questions or whatever. I'll just stop sharing the screen. Okay, so 